up, so y'all better get this right on the first time. You ready? Good morning. <laughs> Amen. Are you glad to be in God's house this morning? You could be in a lot worse place. Amen. It's good to be in God's house. I'm thankful that every single one of you are here today. It is good to come together to worship the Lord, to just to fellowship with one another. So let's begin with a word of prayer and ask God to bless us today. Father, as we come before you this morning, Lord, I want to stop and thank you so much for who you are. Father, as our great God, Father, that we get to worship you every day. But Father, on Sundays, we get to come together in this place to worship you together. And Father, I just ask right now that you would bless every aspect of our service. Lord, from our praise and worship, to our fellowship, to our giving, to the preaching of your word. Lord, we desire to honor and glorify you today. And we ask all these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. All right, let's go ahead and say our memory verse all together. John 15, 3. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. John 15, 3. Would y'all stand with me as we worship the Lord together this morning?
one that happened along the way <coughs> when we were getting ready to go from O'Hare uh, Airport and such. I hobbled all the way through with my cane and such, and we were just getting ready to get on the airplane. And the ticket taker said, do you need a wheelchair? I said, no, I'm, I'm, I'm fine. I, I can get this. And she said, stubborn? I said, no, I'm, I'm good. I, I can get this. And she said, stubborn? <laughs> so when we came back, I decided I'd get a wheelchair. You know something? That's an easy way to get around airports. <laughs> they just wheel you later. And it's great. And because of the lines that you have to go through for everybody else with a wheelchair, I'll get to go in front. So we got through really quick. <laughs> everybody else was standing in line. We got to the airplane, and they were loading, and Nobody else had showed up yet. So we said, well, guess we better get on the airplane. So we got on the airplane. And we sat there, and they said, we're going to get ready to close the doors. We hadn't seen anybody except for me and Judy. And then they said, we are going to close the doors. And then they showed up. They were almost late. <laughs> And we would have had to leave them there, which I'm sure that they would have been very unhappy about. Uh, well, at least for a day or two. But anyways, yes, it was a good time. We enjoyed ourselves, and we are back, and we are glad for that. Now, let's see what we have in store for this week. Let's take our bulletins. Tonight is a one-up awards night. That means we're going to give the kids all the awards that they've, get, that they've got throughout the year. We welcome everybody. It uh, doesn't matter if you've got... Um, Kids there or not, come. You'll enjoy it. Uh, you'll see the kids getting those rewards, and we will give you ice cream. So that's nice. Wednesday is our prayer meeting. Uh, Thursday is the men's Bible study. And next week, for Sunday school, we will have Easter breakfast. We're actually going to start at 8.45 to 9.30. Everything's been signed up for. Judy was going to, oh, wait a minute. One dozen rolls we need yet. If, if somebody can get that signed up for, we would appreciate that. She came in earlier and said she had everything. Obviously, she didn't have everything. Okay. But anyways, that's always a good time. We come, we cook, we feed everybody for uh, breakfast. We come in to have our regular morning service uh, and such. It's always a good time. Uh, you'll see also there is a celebration of marriage. Uh, Shelby. Shelby. I didn't do that. <laughs> Shelby Brown and uh, his her, her husband B are going to have a uh, celebration here at the church on April 7th from 2 o'clock to 5 o'clock, and we're all invited. Uh, so if you can come and enjoy that, that'll be great. <clears throat> For upcoming events, we have um, a Easter Sunday, of course, and then the Golden Group on Thursday, April 4th. Ladies Bible study April 4th. Uh, Deacons meeting Saturday April 13th. Gideons are going to be here on April 14th. And then we're, we're planning on a progressive dinner uh, Saturday April 27th. So Judy will be giving us more information on that and we'll be asking for people to come <coughs> sign up for that. That's always a, a fun time also. Um, I think that's it for the announcements. Uh, for the prayer sheet, Sharon Smith, uh, she did fall, uh, she did hurt herself, um, they thought she was going to have to have some surgery, they've actually put that surgery off for right now, she had some um, blood uh, in her head because she had twisted it, she didn't hit it, but she had twisted it and, and there was blood getting up there, that has gone away now, so that's good, but they do have her in a back brace. Uh, and so she, she's in uh, Redalia. Yeah. Um, so be praying for her that she gets better. It's going to take a while to do that. All right. I think that was everything. Is there something that I may have missed or something to add something? All right. Thank you very much. Did you get your
Bibles, go with me to Acts chapter 23 is where we're at this morning. And as you're turning there, we have actually two things. One, just because Tom got a wheelchair doesn't mean all of you will try to get wheelchairs because <laughs> you may get other comments thrown at you when you try to get one. But um, Secondly, on top of praying for Miss Sharon, if you would keep my dear wife in your prayers this week, Wednesday, she's got surgery and hopefully it'll help her breathe a little bit better with some of the issues she's been having. So, All right, Acts chapter 23. The Bible says, Paul, looking intently at the council, said, Brethren, I've lived my life with a perfectly good conscience before God up to this day. The high priest Ananias commanded those standing beside him to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God is going to strike you, you whitewashed wall. Do you sit to try me according to the law, and in violation of the law order me to be struck? But the bystander said, Do you revile God's high priest? And Paul said, I was not aware, brethren, that he was high priest. For it is written, You shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. But perceiving that one group were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, Paul began crying out in the council, Brethren, I am a Pharisee, a son of Pharisees. I am on trial for the hope and resurrection of the dead. As he said this, there occurred a dissension between the Pharisees and Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, nor an angel, nor a spirit. But the Pharisees acknowledge them all, and there occurred a great uproar. And some of the scribes of the Pharisee, or Pharisaic party stood up and began to argue heatedly, saying, We find nothing wrong with this man. Suppose a spirit or an angel had spoken to him. And as a great dissension was developing, the commander was afraid Paul would be torn to pieces by them and order the troops to go down and take him away from them by force and bring him into the barracks. But on the night immediately following, the Lord stood at his side and said, Take courage, for as you have solemnly witnessed to my cause at Jerusalem, so you must witness at Rome also. When it was day, the Jews formed a conspiracy and bound themselves under an oath, saying that they would neither eat nor drink until they had killed them. There were more than 40 who formed this plot. They came to the chief priests and the elders and said, We have bound ourselves under a solemn oath to taste nothing until we have killed Paul. Now therefore you and the council notified the commander to bring him down to you, as though you were going to determine his case by a more thorough investigation. And we, for our part, are ready to slay him before he comes near the place. But the son of Paul's sister heard of their ambush, and he came and entered the barracks and told Paul, Paul called one of the centurions to him and said, Lead this young man to the commander, for he has something to report to him. So he took him and led him to the commander, and said, Paul the prisoner called me to him, and asked me to lead this young man to you, since he has something to tell you. The commander took him by the hand, and stepping aside, began to inquire of him privately, What is it that you have to report to me? He said, The Jews have agreed to ask you to bring Paul down tomorrow to the council, as though they were going to inquire somewhat more thoroughly about him, so do not listen to them, for more than forty of them are lying in wait for him, who have been bound themselves under a curse, not to eat or drink until they slay me. And now they are ready and waiting for the promise from you. So the commander let the young man go, instructing him, Tell no one that you have notified me of these things. He called to him two of the centurions and said, Get two hundred soldiers ready by the third hour of the night to proceed to Caesarea, with seventy horsemen and two hundred spearmen. They were also to provide mounts to put Paul on and bring him safely to Felix the governor. And he wrote a letter having this form. Claudius Lysias, to the most excellent governor Felix, greetings. When this man was arrested by the Jews and was about to be slain by them, I came up to them with the troops and rescued him, having learned that he was a Roman, and wanted to ascertain the charge for which they were accusing him, I brought him down to their council. And I found him to be accused over questions about their law but under no accusation deserving death or imprisonment. When I was informed that there would be a plot against the man, I sent him to you at once, also instructing his accusers to bring charges against him before you. So the soldiers, in accordance with their order, took Paul and brought him by night to Antipatris. The next day, leaving the horsemen to go on with him, they returned to the barracks. When these had come to Caesarea and delivered the letter to the governor, they also presented Paul to him. When he read it, he asked from what province he was. When he learned that he was from Cilicia, he said, I will give you a hearing after your accusers arrive also, giving orders for him to be kept in Herod's praetorium. All right, this time, would you all stand with me? 
we have a new song to introduce for Easter. And next Sunday, I imagine I'll probably hear several people say this. I'll probably say it a handful of times, but we're going to practice early. He is risen. <laughs> we can do a little bit better than that, right? I mean, is it just, yeah, Christ is risen. Yeah, sure. He is risen. He is risen. As you can join along as you pick up with the song, please do. But hopefully, when we sing this, we have to sing it with a smile because we are rejoicing and glad that we serve a risen Savior. Amen?
I do want to commend every single one of you because when we do have visitors, it's something that almost every visitor we have comments on the fact that when they come and they visit this church, that our church family is very welcoming. And that meet and greet time and that fellowship, folks, it, it's, it's a blessing to my heart when I hear visitors say that, but it's also a blessing because I see it. So um, it's good when we love each other and we can enjoy that. Amen? Amen. All right. Let's have one more song together before our, the message this morning. Lord, what would you have me to give? 
And when we know and we go to him with that desired purpose that, Lord, I want you to show me, Lord, reveal and impress upon my heart what it is you want from me. And then when I know what God wants from me and he lays those things on my heart, then when I give them to him, there is joy unspeakable. And it has nothing to do with what specific, the specifics of those giving are. It's the fact that my Father in Heaven has given me something that He wants me to give to Him. And I know that if I have the heart that says, Lord, whatever you ask, I'll do. Dear my, send me to know that He takes, no matter how big or small it looks in the world's eyes, it pleases Him. And there is great joy for us. So I hope you'll see that. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7 says, Each one, we all have our own responsibility, each one must do just as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Now do you see those words, each one? That, that means you and me, so you can almost write your name in there. I must do just as he purposed. But that word must, that's a command. So I must do, and that's an indication of action. So what is it that I must do? Just as I have purposed in my heart. I love the use of the word purposed. In fact, I've shared this many times, but one of my favorite, if not my favorite verse in the Old Testament is Daniel 1.8. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the king's meat or the king's wine. But it's a predetermined choice. It's saying, I'm choosing now to do whatever, whenever you dictate it. You want me to give something to you right now? Or if you want over the next year for me to do this for you? Or you want me to eventually give this to you? Lord, I'm choosing now. I want to determine in my heart now that whatever you ask of me, I will do. Ladies and gentlemen, this right here, that predetermined choice has got to be something that is part of our lives as God's children. Because I'm going to tell you right now, if we are, hopefully, living in the last days. And I only say if, because no man knows the day or the hour. But, I do believe the rapture is coming soon. And how thrilling it is to think about the fact. I mean, how amazing would it be, whether it's today or, or maybe the next Sunday. Next Sunday, we get done eating breakfast, and we come out here, and then we begin to sing, you know, uh, about our risen living Savior, and all of a sudden, a trumpet sounds, and he calls us home. Wouldn't that be incredible? It would be amazing. And to know that we could be living in the days when the rapture happens. But we don't know when it's going to happen. We don't know how hard life may get for us before that comes. You know, and, and I'm not getting up here to talk politics, but we're, we're coming into this election year, right? What if Across this nation, people get elected into offices that universally hate God and oppose Christianity. And over the next four or five years, if God should tarry, that we begin to learn what real persecution looks like. You know, we were, it was such a blessing to have the Hendricks with us last week and, and in talking to them. You know, you hear missionary stories, but then sitting there and talking to somebody who I already knew, I, I consider both Christian and Sean are friends, but hearing him start to share some things about real things that they face every day. And it was no coincidence that uh, we've been going through the Beatitudes with the teenagers on Sunday night. And so right there at the end, blessed are those who are persecuted for my name's sake. And we're talking about it. And the fact of the matter is, and I don't think anybody would argue with me on this one, but we as Americans, we have no clue what real persecution looks like. The most that we endure of uh, forms of persecution is being maybe mocked or ridiculed for our beliefs. I've never faced the threat of having my head cut off, or being thrown into a cage and drowned, or being beaten mercilessly, mercilessly no, without mercy, until I just collapsed from the pain. I've never experienced that threat. There's nothing promising. 
that I won't experience that threat before my Savior calls me home. If I don't have that predetermined choice in my heart that, Lord, I'm going to follow you and I'm going to stand for you until the day you call me home. You know what's going to happen if I don't already have that predetermined choice in my mind and in my heart? When I start to face that persecution, then I'm going to start weighing in the human side of things like, I don't want to experience pain. And it's not so much that I want to turn my back on Jesus Christ, but I don't want to die. I, I, I mean, I don't want to leave my wife and kids possibly without a, a dad and a husband in the home. And I can start allowing all those human thoughts to come in and weigh me down. But you know, in Daniel 1.8, when it said he purposed in his heart, he did that before he even went to God and asked for provision. And he did it before he went to the, the Ashkenaz. The, the man who was in charge of him and asked for permission to have the, the, the vegetable and water diet. He predetermined ahead of time. That is something that needs to be part of our walk with the Lord. It's a predetermination that, Lord, I'm going to follow you tomorrow, but I'm going to follow you today. I'm going to follow you every day this week. I'm going to follow you every week for the rest of my life. I'm determining that now because you know what? There's going to be a lot of excuses that come up between even now and the end of the day, amen, as to why I shouldn't serve him, why I shouldn't walk with him or shouldn't follow him. I need to predetermine that, Lord, I want to follow you. And so therefore, Lord, I need your grace. I need your strength every second of every day because I don't want to fail you. I don't want to let you down. When I stop and consider all that you have done for me. It's a predetermined plan of action. And as you start to think about any upcoming plans, what is, what is it that helps you get those things accomplished? Now let's say we've got Easter breakfast next Sunday. Does that just happen to all fall together? We put out sheets of assignment. Why? Because we want things to go well. If you were going to start remodeling a part of your home, are you just going to immediately, before you go check what the prices of new uh, materials are, do you just immediately grab a sledgehammer and start taking down a wall? Of course not. You plan those things out. <coughs> when it comes to giving to the Lord, how is it that we determine what to give? The scripture clearly teaches us that we are not to give grudgingly or under compulsion. If you give to God with any form of regret, you're giving grudgingly. So you cannot be a cheerful giver if you're focused on the amount or the gift or whatever it may be under compulsion. It's another no-no that scripture says there. When you give out of guilt or fear, it removes the possibility of being a cheerful giver. Now that punches a hole in prosperity teaching. But that's okay because we should all desire what the Bible teaches, amen? Giving is not to be an obligation. It should be a desire that we have in our heart. So coming back to the determination step, ask the Lord. Ask the Holy Spirit, Lord, lead me in what you would have me to give. And then rejoice and be cheerful when you see just how he supplies the gift that he calls you to give. Now there's the introduction into our text. But it's foundational to the example that we're given. So go down to Acts chapter 4, verse 36. Acts chapter 4, verse 36 is where we're at. You can follow around, follow along in Scripture, or you can follow along up here on the screen. But verse 36 says, Now Joseph, a Levite of Cyprian birth, who was also called Barnabas by the apostles, which translated means son of encouragement. Now, <laughs> We're introduced to a very important character here in Acts. But we don't think of him as just your average Joe. We know him better by his other name, Barnabas. This is the guy who God uses in a tremendous way in Paul's life. He, he's the uncle of John Mark, the same John Mark who wrote the Gospel of Mark. His sister hosted the church in Jerusalem at her house. But note the meaning of Barnabas. Son of of encouragement. How appropriate. Despite his later parting with Paul, he truly was an encourager. 
You know, the only details to his background are given here. He's a Levite who was born on the island of Cyprus, an island that was almost 300 miles off the coast of Israel. But more than his background, Luke records actions in Barnabas' life that reveal his heart. See, verse 37 goes on to say that he owned a tract of land and sold it and brought up the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now, that tract of land was maybe something like a field, but it wasn't his main house or primary dwelling place, something he owned. So he sells it, he brings it to the disciples, and he didn't tell them what to do with it. <coughs> he wasn't asked to sell it. The Lord laid it on his heart, and he gave it willingly and cheerfully. Folks, and this is a brief but perfect example of the heart of a cheerful giver. I would prefer to stop here with the good and to say, here's what we need and be done for today. But we need to see the bad in order to know what to be on guard against. So let's go ahead and read verses 1 through 11 here in chapter 5. You can follow along in your copy of God's Word, or I do have the words up on the screen. But starting in verse 1, the Bible says, But a man named Ananias... With his wife Sapphira, sold a piece of property, kept back some of the price for himself, with his wife's full knowledge, and bringing a portion of it, he laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said to Ananias, Why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back some of the price of the land? Why it remained unsold? Did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not under your control? Why is it that you have conceived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to men but to God. And as he heard these words, Ananias fell down and breathed his last. And great fear came over all who heard of him. The young men got up and covered him up, and after carrying him out, they buried him. Now there elapsed an interval of about three hours, and his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter responded to her, Tell me, tell me whether you sold the land for such and such a price? And she said, Yes, that was the price. And Peter said to her, is it that you have agreed together to put the Spirit of the Lord to the test? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out as well. And immediately she fell at his feet and breathed her last. And the young man came in and found her dead, and they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear came over the whole church and over all who heard of these things. Now we know you can fool some people some of the time. You can fool most people most of the time. But you can never fool everyone all the time. You can never fool God. Amen? Amen. Here we see a husband and a wife and they sell a piece of property. If you own something, you have the right to sell it, correct? I mean, they went, they sell this land, but do you notice the first word? What's, what's the first word of verse 1 there? But. Okay, we just read about Barnabas selling his piece of land, cheerfully giving it later at the apostles' feet. And then we get another story, but it's connected by the conjunction there, but. And so there's this contrast, comparison that's going on. There's a spiritual pretense that exists in the heart of Ananias and Sapphira. You know, a pretense is a false claim or an attempt to make something that is not the case appear to be true. Verse 1 doesn't necessarily indicate the pretense, but verse 2 does. He kept back some of the price for himself with his wife's full knowledge. And bringing a portion of it, he laid it at the apostles' feet. Now, if we didn't have the rest of the story, there still doesn't appear to necessarily be anything wrong, okay? They sold the land. Let's say they sold it for $100,000, okay? And they decided to keep half of that, but they gave $50,000 to the church. Well, shoot, if something like that happened today, we'd be, we'd be praising the Lord. And it, it's incredible how God has provided and even if we don't know who the individual is, which sometimes that's the best way, and we'll get to that in a little bit here, but someone gave a great amount of money just for God's glory and the benefit of the church. We would rejoice over that. There'd be nothing wrong with it. But the 
rest of the story starts to reveal the problem here. See, if you remove the first half of that verse, then you really have no problem. It was nowhere required that these two go and sell all that they had or give everything that they got from the property. They would have totally been blessed to have given half or a third of the selling price. Unfortunately, that's not what happens. It's never going to be demanded of anyone here at this church to go sell your land and give everything you've got to the church. One of the biggest reasons that this was starting to happen, that Barnabas did it and many others would do this, is because there was great need in the church that was exploding in Jerusalem. Remember, at Pentecost, how many people got saved? The Bible tells us there was at least 3,000 and that more were being added to the church every day. Do you remember the beginning of chapter 4 when we read Peter and John going to the temple after healing the lame man? They got, by the time they get done preaching and the Sadducees and the priests and the guards come out, over 4,000 men had gotten saved. The church was exploding incredibly, and there was great need because a lot of these people didn't live in Jerusalem. They'd come to Jerusalem for, Pente or for a Passover and then experiencing and getting to know who Jesus Christ really was and putting their faith and trust in Him. They chose at that point to begin following Him. And we don't necessarily have a need like that today. And while it may not be necessary, might we say that, you know, here's where a good point, if you got your Bibles, go with me to Matthew chapter 4. When you give, should you tell anybody what you're giving? Okay. The silence means you meant no, right? Okay. It's nobody's business what the Lord lays on your heart that you choose to give to the Lord. Something I, I try very hard to stay away from any of the records of the financial giving because I don't want to know. It's not my job to know what any one of you gives to the Lord. It's my job to encourage you as your pastor and as your brother in Christ to give to him cheerfully. And if you're doing that, the dollar amount's not going to matter. It's not that we don't need to raise money for certain things or we don't need to be giving, but the amount is not the issue. It's the attitude of the heart with which we give. And that's not just our money, folks. It's the attitude that we need and how we give it to the Lord and how we serve Him. We need some people to step up. We need some men to step up and say, you know what? I want to give them my time because I know we need men to step up and be leaders in the church. So even though I don't, hopefully none of you men think that you're the best candidate for it, hopefully the attitude is, uh, the reason I don't volunteer to be a deacon or anything like that, pastor, is because I know I'm not the worst choice. Believe me, Having the humble heart, recognizing that none of us are worthy of that position, that's what the Lord's looking for. But those are the men he takes and can use in a great, mighty way. Remember, David was known as a man after God's own heart, and despite his, some of his greatest failures, the Lord still looked at his heart, and he saw the heart that loved the Lord and wanted to give unto him. Not because he deserved it, not because he was the best, but because he just said, yes, Lord. We need some people who are willing to step up and keep teaching in our Sunday school classes, in our Awana, other things. Don't worry about whether or not you're qualified. The only qualification really that's necessary in most cases like this is the heart that says, yes, Lord, I'll do whatever you want me to do. Now, Matthew chapter 6, the Bible says, so that your giving will be what? In secret. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. The thing that I love is while people may have known that Barnabas sold the land, you know what I love about the, the, the fact in that story? It doesn't say how much he sold the land for. It doesn't say how much money he gave to the, the apostles. It just says he laid it at the apostles' feet. Use it for the Lord's purpose. Use it for whatever has need here in the church. It doesn't matter who gives the most in this church. And if that's your goal, you are already forfeiting yourselves from all the blessings that come when giving unto the Lord. But when you give to him cheerfully, it's incredible what he takes and does with it. Sadly, this lie of Ananias and Sapphira was only the external sin of a deeper problem. 
had a deeper problem was there was a desire to appear spiritual for men's approval. Boy, folks, we need to guard against hypocrisy in our lives. We may be tempted to think that that's no big deal. You know, in our culture today, so what? They lied about, I don't know how much they gave. Is that really that big of a deal? We have to consider Jesus Christ was. Jesus had a lot to say about hypocrisy. If you're still there in Matthew chapter 6, I want you to flip back to verse number 1. I'm going to read verses 1 through 6, and then I'm going to read verses 16 through 18. But Jesus has a bit to say on this. Starting in verse 1, he says, Beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. So when you give to the poor, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, so that they may be honored by men. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. But when you give to the poor, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving will be in secret, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. When you pray, you're not to be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners so that they may be seen by men. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. But you, when you pray, go into your inner room, close your door, and pray to your Father who's in secret. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Okay, i got to stop here. Why? Whenever I see the words will or shall, what is that? God's promises. And when God says something will or will not happen, has he ever failed to break one of his promises? Not once. He promises. Going on to verse 16. Whenever you fast, do not put on a gloomy face as the hypocrites do, for they neglect their appearance so that they will be noticed by men when they are fasting. Truly I say to you, they have the reward in full. But you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, so that your fasting will not be noticed by men, but by your Father, who is in secret. And your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. You think Jesus had a high opinion of hypocrisy? Pretended to be something that you're not. You know where the word hypocrite comes from? The Greek word that they used it for was actually where we get uh, it was used to describe actors. People who would put on a mask pretend to be something that they're not. Folks, we were in Sunday school this morning, we were talking about Christ's resurrection. How excited we ought to be. The impact of knowing we serve a risen Savior and how that should impact how we live our lives for Jesus Christ every single day, how we talk to others about him. And yet, is that joy evident? It should be. I have this quote here. None are so ugly in God's sight as those who flaunt a spiritual beauty they do not possess. You know, Peter gets to Ananias he says, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? He lied about how much he gave. So what? What's the big deal? Well, that's the problem. There are too many believers who are not worried about what God says. Maybe if we really believed God would strike us dead, we would then care a lot more about the details. Now, folks, I, I don't want this to sound like a threat, but I pray that we hear the warning and plea to avoid deceitfulness in our lives and in our service to God. I'd much rather this example from Scripture to have the right effect on us and not us follow the wrong one here. Verse 4, you know, we need a fear of God in our lives, but there is great joy in fearing the Lord. There should be a terror, not from sin, because we sadly are going to sin. Thank you, Lord, for your tender mercy. No, the terror should be from developing an apathy towards God's will and his standards. You know, as our text continues, we see that God takes Ananias' life. 
And the reason for the quick burial there was somewhat customary because it was a hot climate. Sadly, we see the power of sin. Where three hours later, Sapphira, his wife, not knowing what had happened, is given a chance to actually come clean. Peter's like, okay, so did, did you really sell the property for such and such a price? And without hesitation, he goes, yep, that's what we sold it for. Verse 9. Peter says, why are you putting the spirit of the Lord to the test? This message is on the heart of giving. And clearly, Barnabas is the pattern for us to follow. Joyful giving to the Lord for his glory. But if we're not careful to fear God, which is living in reverential awe of who he is, and having a right perspective of who he is and what his word says, if we don't fear God and seek to obey him, we're no different than anyone else. It's a fire. Believe I ask you, is there an area in your life right now where you are testing him? Oh, no, no, no. I, I don't test God. Are you obeying him in everything? Well, you know, I'm, I'm obeying him in this area, this area, and uh, I still got a little bit of work to do, but we, we don't have to rush. Are we seeking, are we purposing in our hearts to obey him in all things? I'm not asking who's perfect in here, because guess what? Not a one of us are. I'm asking, how many of us truly have a desire to obey the Lord and do what His Word says? Not what we think we should be doing. What His Word says. So here's the thing, we can't fool God. Are we like the Pharisees who pretend to be spiritual? But we're always seeking to test God, to try him, to find some loophole? Or are we seeking to follow him wherever he leads? You know, next Sunday we're going to celebrate Easter. And we're going to rejoice because he rose from that grave. But before he came out of that grave, he first died on the cross. Friend, I... I plead with each and every one of you. If, and I say if because I'm not a mind reader. I don't know what's going on in every one of your hearts and minds. I don't know what's going on in any of your hearts and minds. I have my suspicions based on how you act and how you live. But I have no clue what exactly is going on in anyone's heart and mind other than my own. So I'm not making accusations here, but I'm challenging you. If there's something in your life that needs to be dealt with, please do so. Not because you're going to answer to me, but because as your brother, as your pastor, I love you and I care about you. And I want to see that cheerful, giving attitude, that joy abounding in each of our lives. Because if you're there and you have it, or, or maybe you, you have walked with the Lord, maybe there's some things right now that you need to straighten out. Because that joy is not what it's supposed to be. But you have experienced that joy, then hopefully you already know what I'm talking about. You know, you can't live without it. There is nothing greater to know that I have right fellowship and a right relationship with Jesus Christ and that I'm doing what his word commands me because there's a joy that is produced by doing it. Even when it's hard because I get to stop, I get to step back and say, God, you're amazing. Because of some of the things you've asked me to do, I know I can't do them on my own. Father, when you provide, and then I respond in obedience, I plead with you. There's an area in your life and you're not being completely honest with him. There's something about you maybe that's hypocritical. Confess. Repent and receive forgiveness. Receive restored fellowship. It can happen instantaneously. Don't let Satan distract you and deceive you into testing God. Rather, let's give him our all for all of our days. Amen? Amen. With your heads bowed, I would be remiss if I didn't say that if you're here today, you don't know what it means to be saved. Maybe you're somebody who watched the video. I don't know. I can tell you with full conviction that Jesus Christ died for your sins. 
recognizing your position as a sinner and crying out to him for forgiveness and saying, Lord, forgive me of my sins and help me turn from them so that I might serve you in my life. He, the moment he hears that from your heart, even before the words come off your lips, he loves you and he saves you. And if you've received that wonderful gift of salvation, then may we seek to obey him and give to him joyfully in all of our life. Father, we love you. I thank you so much for the great privilege of serving you. Father, the privilege we've had even to be here today, I, I pray that you bless each and every one that's here. But I pray today that as we leave this place, we will go out with the joy of the Lord in our hearts. Father, that we will serve you joyfully, cheerfully, all of our days. We ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Would y'all stand with me as we close with an invitation? We love him because he first loved us. As you see this, I hope and believe that every one of you mean it when you sing it, but think about these words. And many times when we have a closing hymn, it's good to sometimes sing them as a prayer. My Jesus.